Welcome to God of Love. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run. It is the return of Dr. Faith Davies. She is the director of the Blood Cancer Center at NYU's Perimolar Cancer Center. I'm delighted to have Dr. Davies back. Thank you so much, Will. It's great to be back. Thank you. I should have mentioned you were here for our 300th edition. I know. I'm very privileged to be that to be your guest on that one. So it's excellent. Um, and uh, but this time, this actually opens up my 13th year producing and hosting Gotta Run on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And I should mention to the audience, a full disclosure, I was diagnosed with smoldering myeloma in 2021. And I am currently a patient at the Perlmutter Cancer Center. For the last 18 months or so, Dr. Davies described my numbers as beautifully stable. Hopefully in 2023, although there's a blip, we're going to monitor that very carefully. And we're going to talk about what that means. That's my disclosure. So last time you were here, we talked about that you and Dr. Morgan were going to come and run and participate in the, in the 5K that the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundations Hells every year in New York City. So how was that day for you and Dr. Morgan? It was amazing. We were really privileged to be a member of your team and you had so many people and it was just great to be with other people who either had friends or family that had been affected by myeloma and importantly to do some running but also to do some fundraising and I, you guys did an amazing job. So um, it, that was it was my fantastic. honor to do it. You know, the reason I was very interested in that, because I haven't met actual people with myeloma and to see them there and they were so positive and so forth. And, and the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation is actually celebrating this year, 2023, its 25th year as an organization. And they, they do an amazing work on these of 5K because as a runner, I've gone to many, many, many types of running organization, running events, and they do a first class. One of the unique things about it that everybody loved, especially I had two photographers and they uh, photograph all sorts of races, especially for New York road runners. So they're pros and they were very, very, very proud of being part of the team, especially at the, at the beginning where they had bubbles coming up where you were running. <laughs> Because where are these bubbles coming from? And also at the finish, when you finish, you had bubbles around you. And they had an amazing, amazing program. They had the national anthem. It was beautifully sung. Early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful rendition. And they also had a guest speaker that gave off the cuff State of the Union for the myeloma community. I think it was Dr. David Wiesel. And one of the things that he said uh, struck me a little funny way. Oh, he said that uh, he's looking forward to a cure by the time he retires. And I, I think I turned to you. When is the doctor retiring? <laughs> <laughs> but that brings, that brings up uh, two questions. One is the 25th year of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. So I did a little research about that. It turns out 27 years ago, the founder of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, Kathy Gusti, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. 
27 years ago. And at that time, the prognosis was she had about three years to live. Obviously, she was stunned. And part of it was that she was in the pharmaceutical industry and she never heard of multiple myeloma. And so when she did a little bit of research, she was further stunned that there was only like two treatments available for it and nothing in the pipeline. Well, as you can imagine, it does not sit well with her. She and her sister, two years later, 25 years ago, founded the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. And what an amazing 25 years it yeah. has been. Not only because of that foundation, because there are now like 31 treatments. There's lots of hope yeah. and lots of possibility for the future. So tell us, doctor, in your opinion, and what does the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation mean to the community? It's huge, because as you say, it's amazing what they've done. I mean, um, as you say, Kathy, at the time when she was diagnosed, she was very young. And there was obviously her children were young and there was all sorts of concerns there. She's still here 27 years later. OK. And I think what's amazing about that foundation is that they have kind of pointed the way for other cancers and other organizations about how to really make a difference. And they've made a difference in so many ways because they've done education and community building for myeloma patients. But then they've also done lobbying of the pharmaceutical industry and lobbying of the health industry generally, the FDA, to make sure that drugs are available for patients. And they've actually, in order to speed that up, have also done clinical trials themselves to make sure that um, we're making progress swiftly and then for the actual research community as well, they've provided funding and tools to get all of the doctors together to make sure that they're all on the same page, trying to make sure that we make progress for this disease. So their kind of template and what they've done has been just revolutionary for myeloma. But as I say, many of the other cancers and, and the health industry generally have been looking at what they've done. Kathy now actually speaks at Harvard Business School about kind of how she developed this and the thought process so that other people can learn about how to do things. It is a beautiful story. And like you said, she's 27 year, years later, she's still, she's still around and kicking at that ass. Yes. <laughs> at the time, uh, she got the stem cell transplant because of help of her twin sister. And uh, she, yeah, I don't know the complete story, but obviously she got to take ma maintenance and so forth and so forth. And they've raised over five hundred million dollars. Oh yes, no, I, yeah, no, no. I was going to say years. they've, in some ways, they brought a lot of their business acumen to how you can make progress and move things forward. So they've been great. And surprisingly, I saw that they only have fifty people in their organization. It's a, yeah. it's a very tight knit organization. Yeah. It's tighten it and it's making sure that every, I'm going to say, I'm going to be American here, every dime they make they use wisely. Oh, and yes, really yes, key. yes. Well, even, even though there's 50 people when, because last year, as you know, I did the 2021 program. And so I got to, to talk to, to, their, to their staff, the New York staff. And it's quite dynamic because uh, they promote their people and some of their people are in Big, they're in big demand because they move on to other organizations. Mm -hmm. But still, the New York program didn't miss a beat. They brought in a, a consultant or somebody temporary, Kathy. She did a phenomenal job in picking up the ball that nobody knew. Mm -hmm. There was a little switch yeah. and it was just an amazing, amazing day. So I'm looking forward to 20. 23. In fact, in 2022, <laughs> you had your own bid to gotta run with Will. That's right. And so in 2023, because of your inspiration, I created my own bib that you can see on the table. And of course, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation was just thrilled that, that we customize things, that we, that we encourage that. Because this is the 25th year, they're going to have a special t-shirt that says 25 years on it. And I said, I'm going to be fundraising. I'm going to encourage people to contribute to get the shirt. And when they're secure, they're all going to be invited to a party that I'm going to hold 
to honor the tour and the ticket to admission is a shirt that says 25 on it. I love it. I love it. I've learned so much in the, in the last year that we that we're here, but I also realized that there's so much more for me to learn. But one of the other doctors, you probably know Dr. Kenny, Dr. Kenneth Anderson at yes, Dana, Dana, Fogg. Dana Fogg. Yes. Very forthcoming, charismatic uh, doctor. He comes every course on video. So my prediction is that in 2030, we will cure myeloma. We will cure it by achieving MRD negativity. And importantly, we will restore the immune response in patients against their own myeloma. Cure then will mean free of disease and off all medicines. It's really the most exciting time ever for researchers, caregivers, and especially for patients. So when you were here last time, I asked your opinion when, it, when there's going to be a cure. So, but the, but the interesting thing is, unlike other cancers like leukemia, I don't hear talk about cures. You know, I hear there's better treatment, but you know, what is it about myeloma, the disease as we know of the bone marrow? Mm -hmm. Leukemia, I know because we all run for the Leukemia Society, it's a cancer that circulates in the blood. So it's very, very different. Why is there talk of a cure for that type of cancer? I think to some extent, because exactly as you've been saying, we've had so many new drugs and we've learned such a lot about it and we've really extended patients' um, kind of outlook and so on. It's kind of getting to the point now that, hey, okay, you know, we can do this. We can actually make a big difference. And um, you're talking about Dr. Anderson, but I actually used to work with him and it would be 25 years ago, actually, when I worked with him. And he's inspirational because he really has, um, along with the MMR, where I've worked to find these new drugs. And I think people are now feeling that maybe we do have many of the tools in the toolbox we need. We actually just need to learn what's the right order to use them in and why are some patients slightly different to others. And once we know that, we put those pieces together and you're exactly right. We're, we're really hoping that we can, you know, that we can cure this. Well, you know, I, I emailed Dr. Dr. Uh, Anderson still thinks that, that 2030s is aspirational. But then I saw a different sequence. In some ways, I know we all feel like cancer has been put on hold. Indeed, current trials are halted and new trials will be delayed. But as a team watching the urgency of this pandemic, I want you to know we are noting every best practice that will allow us to make up time in myeloma. That they're picking up the pace. So, uh, so I really like that. It, sometimes you, you get emotional about this, but you, you talked about the right combination. So the, the term sequencing, I saw. So, so the journey, to the myeloma journey is an interesting one because although it's a rare disease, it's, it's very, very different. It's not homogeneous. It's, in fact, it's heterogeneous. And so, although there are so many different therapies, you gotta work very closely with the doctor about sequencing. So tell us what the sequencing mean, uh, because, because the way I understand it is, you may have, luckily you may have more than, more than one pathway of, and you can say, all right, you know, based on your genetics or whatever it is that's your, that makes up your myeloma, this, this is a sequence you can take, you know, you can start with perhaps stem cell, perhaps something else, or something else. It's important to keep that in mind because if, you're, if you go out of sequence, it sort of burns that bridge. Oh, you know, because some of the drugs stop working and so you may not be able to go back to it. So tell us about, especially a patient that goes from watchful waiting to, oh, okay, we waited long enough. We now know it's coming. Okay. And, and the thinking is, if you know it's coming, you want to attack it right now. You're not going to wait till, you, you know, your bones are cracking. Exactly. All right. So tell us about that. Yeah. No. So you're completely correct. Um, as we were talking earlier, 27 years ago, we didn't have many drugs. Now we have an array of drugs. And the key is 
rarely do we use one drug on its own. We usually use them in a combination because we know that when we put the drugs together, each drug works slightly harder than it does when it's on its own. So a kind of team of drugs is important. But when we are looking at a patient, we actually have to say, right, OK, what do we know about their actual myeloma? What do we know about that patient and their general health? Do they have problems with their heart? Do they have problems with their blood pressure? Do they have problems with their kidneys? OK. And then also now we're in the position of saying, OK, what about the patients the rest of their life? Would they prefer an intravenous drug? Are they working? Would they prefer a tablet? Are they looking after their grandchildren? All of these kind of things. How far away from the hospital do they live? And so we try and take all of those things into account and we build our kind of treatment combination by looking at those different things. And as you say, each patient's different. So some patients, they may have problems with their kidneys. And so certain drugs might not be appropriate for them um, or they may have a problem with their heart. And so we do this building it into a group and then we use that treatment. And then unfortunately, as you say, sometimes the disease goes down and then unfortunately might pop back up again at some point in the future. And at that time, we then do a similar kind of process, but we also say, did they get on well with this drug last time or did they have side effects? And so could we use that drug again or do we need to move on and use something different? And so we're always, as, um, as the patient's going through their treatment journey, every time we see the patient, we're always running through some questions in our head of saying, right, okay, are we heading off down the right path? It's a bit like reading a map, I guess, isn't it? That you know you're on a journey and you know this is the way you want to go. But sometimes, unfortunately, there might be some form of accident or something. And so you need to take a slightly different route to get there. And so we're always looking at that and trying to say, right, OK, are we moving in the right way? Do we need to change things a little bit? Right, right. So I, can, I think what I'm hearing is communications. It's very oh, key. Definitely. You, you need the patient needs to articulate, you know, what's important to them. Like you said, you know, is it is it uh, that the best quality of life, or you know, you want to most aggressive drugs, you know, and and also um, besides, you know, the family situation, you know, how frail you are. So if you're in your 90s, might be very different <laughs> protocol if you're in your if you're as young as, sometimes as young as in your 40s or 30s, although it's right. very rare. Yes. I think let's say 1% is under 40. 40. That's but right. it happens. Oh, yes, it definitely happens. Also, uh, communications is very important. And one of the things that all the major hospitals is to have something called my chart. So when you go in for your blood test, the results are uh, posted in the my chart. And when you go for your visits, the doctor usually does an after visit summary. So you can't confirm what you heard because sometimes did they say something that I, about whatever it is and you can read about it and confirm it. And what I discovered was useful about by my chart is I have other doctors <clears throat> and they're interested in what's going on with the blood work because they do their own blood work. For example, my primary care physician, he does blood work, but it's different. And so using my chart, we can coordinate the blood work so we can do it all at once, yep. at one time. So he'll, he'll give me the paperwork, submit it to, to the blood guy, and we, we get all, yeah. we got nine tubes instead of six tubes. <laughs> so we always chart, like a lot of blood. <laughs> so my chart is, is, is very important in communications, especially something that, that didn't exist 27 years ago. So, but I can see that my chart, that people need to understand how to use that because it's not, it's not a 911 thing. So if you're having, you know, an emergency, you should probably call 911, don't go to my chart. So in your opinion, in your, in your, the way you've seen my chart being used, what is the most appropriate way to communicate to your staff using my chart? No, I completely agree. So I think it depends on what the problem is. So you're exactly right, that, that gives the, patient and the doctor chance to communicate and it also gives the other doctors chance to look and see what's going on but if it's an you can message in it and you can let us know what's going on but that kind of relies on the doctor or their team to be looking at the computer at that particular point in time okay and that may not always be possible so I usually say if it's not something urgent if you don't need the answer now 
and say you, you're okay to have the answer in 24 hours time, then by all means use my chart. And if it's a simple question, so if it's something that's like a yes or a no or a do this, then that's good. But if it's something that needs a little bit more explanation, it's much actually much better to phone and to have that conversation because you, you don't want it to kind of get misread in the, in the writing. And certainly if it's something emergent and urgent, then you need to use yeah, nine yes. nine. yes. As you know, I belong to a couple of uh, support groups of, in the sense that people get together, they just, you know, they have small myeloma, they have myeloma, and they talk to other people. And some of the things that you hear, you know, it breaks your heart. A wife comes on, her husband was just diagnosed, she's pregnant, you know, they got two kids and they want him to live, they want him to be around for the, you know, so forth, so they want to know. And it's very hard to answer that question because that's really a conversation that you should have with your, with your doctors, you know, we can, what we do is in the, in the community is to offer support. Yes, there's a lot of hope and, and so forth. And communication is very important, it's particularly in, 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 in getting to know your, in getting to have a specialist on the team. Yes. Um, the last time we, we were here, you talked about the promise of T-cell therapy. Hopefully it replaces chemotherapy. It's a part of the immunotherapy. So tell us about, I think at the time, one was just approved. Tell us what is T-cell and why, why is it so promising? As you say, we've always used chemotherapy, um, which has quite a lot of side effects because it not only affects the myeloma cell, it affects the rest of the body. More recently, we've now had some targeted treatments. So that's very good. They just home in on the myeloma cell. But now the treatments are getting much cleverer. We're trying to convince the patient's own immune system to do the killing rather than us having to, to give other treatments. And so there's two new treatments that have come forward and are really making a huge difference. One is this CAR T cell, which is where we take a patient's own T cells and in the lab, we change them a little bit to make them recognize the myeloma and then we give them them back. OK, and there are now two available products on the market for that and lots more coming behind. So it's a big expanding field. And then the other treatment that's in the same kind of line is called a bispecific antibody. And what that means is that kind of an antibody with two hands, one side grabs the myeloma cell, the other side grabs the patient's immune cell, the patient's T cell, and it brings them together. So it forces them together, and the T cell then kills off the myeloma ah, cell. Ah, so the T cells are professional killers. They are professional killers, but sometimes they hide somewhere and they need to be like, you know, so the brought into line. Now, the way I understand it, bispecifics is, is more off the shelf than yes. T cells, because T cells, usually you need to be at a major laboratory because it may take several weeks to, yes. to take those yes. T cells out of you. Yes. Then they gotta send them to, to school to, to learn yes. how to, whatever it. they need to do and then put it back. So that takes several weeks. weeks. Yeah. It takes time. But the pie specifics. Yep, they're in, they're in the fridge. Yes, and they're, oh, they're, they're ready to, ready to so go. So is that, I think they just approved a couple yes, of them? they've just approved one, okay, and there's a, again, there's some more coming along behind that one as well. Okay, so. now in terms of sequencing, <laughs> is, 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 is T-cells and pi specific is that down the road in the sense that we're not going to do that right off the bat, we're going to try these more traditional therapies? You know, how does that work? Yeah, no, no. So the way the FDA does this is that we have to go through a very strict process to make sure that we're doing good, not any harm. And so at the moment, these treatments have tended to be for patients who've had lots of other treatments. But the reason we're so excited about them is that they're making such a huge difference in that area. And so there's now lots of studies going on bringing these treatments further forward. And there's some studies which are just about to start actually looking at them for newly diagnosed patients. So they're all kind of coming forward because we're all excited about them. 
you're quite correct. One of the interesting things is we don't currently know whether a T, whether the CAR T cell is better than the bispecific or the other way round. And all of the doctors love getting together to have a big discussion as to you know which one's better. I think from a patient's perspective, having both of them and having the choice is is the most important thing. Yes, yes. So I was reading that the CAR T cells are so so promising that sometimes they'll use it as a bridge to something else. Yes, that's uh, because. Right. Uh, because it is so, uh, and, and I, I think they said traditional drugs, you know, if, if you get a 40% response rate, they, they're, they're happy. But with T cells and pi-specific, they're getting 80, 85, 90, 95%. Yes. Yeah. Now, the, the only thing they're not, because it's so new, they don't know what the remission is. Exactly. Is it long lasting? Will it last? Yes. You know, How long will it last? That's, that's, that's right. Those are the questions. So what you're saying is for people living with myeloma, they can't do better and live a better life for a longer time. Yes, yes. There's hope for that. Oh, golly, definitely. Yes. That's very positive. Yes. We could almost end there, but <laughs> this is a running show. It is. And I heard I... That somebody did the New York City half. I know. I'm here with my medal. I'm very proud. It so... was a cold and windy day. It was a very cold and windy day. And it took me a wee while. I haven't done a half marathon for a long time. So I was um, the slow, steady one at the back. But I run every step and I enjoyed every minute. I know you do the five Ks every time the Multiple yes. Myeloma Research Foundation, yeah. different parts of the country, cities, and they sometimes they'll have a conference with the uh, like Scottsdale. Scottsdale, last year. yes. You yeah. and Dr. Morgan went because I think it was the inaugural or something or another, and you were there. So for this year, for 2023, do you have any other five Ks? So the main five K I have planned actually at the moment is I'm gonna run with Will. So I've gotta That's run with October, Will. That's in October. Yeah. No, I can say I've just done this one. I now need to plan some extra things to do in the gap. So um, it's always nice to have something to aim for. Well. You also mentioned that, you know, because of the pandemic, you had dreams of doing a, a triathlon. Is, is that down the road? <laughs> so, so I'm still thinking about that one. So I'm not entirely sure about when, when to do it. I'm a, I'm a little scared, if I dare admit it. So um, I need to kind of um, get myself sorted. Okay. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It is. And the, the other thing, oh, I should mention, the other thing we talked about uh, last time, the SMART program. And I think it's, it's spelled S-M-R-T. Yes. So how is that going? I think it's almost closer to one year anniversary for it. Yes. No, that's completely right. Yeah. So that's a, a study where we're specifically concentrating on smoldering myeloma patients. And we are doing a whole series of tests on them um, so that we can try and figure out, number one, why they got smoldering myeloma. And then number two, is there anything that we can use to say, hey, Yours is going to stay quiet and don't need to worry about it, whereas actually we're a little bit worried about yours that it might go on. And then the third bit of it is, if we can do that, is there something we could do to stop it moving forward? And so the study's going really well. We have ourselves, we have MD Anderson, we've got um, guys in Miami, in Alabama, at MSK. So there's patients all over the country oh, wow. which are, are, are being so gracious and kind to let us collect their data and to give us extra bits of samples so that we can do all of these, oh, these kind of studies. Excellent. The Promise program does the same thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Collect, uh, they collect uh, samples and so forth. Exactly. And, I, and I donate as much as I can of my samples. Yeah. I, put it up on the databases. Mm -hmm. And it's just so good. And what the PROMISE program, it probably yours, uh, 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 although it's a rare disease, blood cancer, it affects African Americans. Yep. I think even more than leukemia, which is hard to believe. Yeah, no, there's three the times, three times more African Americans than there are Caucasians. This, but of course, for whatever reason, African Americans are usually underrepresented under these trials. But I think the promise in yours, you've got, you're doing a special effort to be diverse. Exactly. Very, very special effort to, to be diverse because we, we recognize that and we need to figure out why is that? Is it something about the genetics? Is it something about where people are living? Is it something about food? 
there's a whole host of different things that it could be. So you're exactly right. And the important thing as well is, as you say, that we have the SMART study, um, but actually, although the smoldering my world is a small world, if that's the right expression. And so we actually work very closely with the people doing promise and so on, because we need to put all of these brains together to actually figure out what's going on. And so we're trying to work together to make progress. Okay, on that note, work together. So we're hoping for one day when you come back, we're talking about a cure. <laughs> Definitely, I will be armed with my 25th t-shirt to come into the party. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much, doctor, for coming in. No, it's lovely. Thank you for having me, Will. Thank you.